Now, dear students, let us discuss some questions from the West Bengal State Eligibility Test. Now, in this case, I have taken the 2017 Computer Science and Application Question Paper from West Bengal SET exam, which is also called as WBSET. Now, the first question that we are discussing is from programming part. So, they are saying that uh, we have four sets P, which is having try, not an union, Q which is having AND, BIT AND and COMPLEX, X which is AUTO, GO TO and IF, and Z which is INT, VOID and NOT. Now they are saying which of the following is correct. Number 1. Element in P are C++ keywords. Element in Q are C++ keywords. Element in X are C keywords only but those Z are not. And elements in X and also Z are C keywords. So they are asking uh, which of the following sets is actually containing the keyword from the C language. Now for this you should know what is the character keyword set for the C language. Actually C language is very very easy uh, because it is having the minimalistic minimalistic keyword set minimal as compared to any other language whether it is C++ whether it is Java whether it is .NET or any other language C language contains the least number of keywords which are approximately 32. Now in case of C++ all these 32 keywords are there but a part of this we have some extra new keywords that they have added in the C++ because C++ is just an incrementation over the C language. Now you can see uh, in this video I have taken the keywords which are present in both C language as well as the C++ language. In both the cases these keywords exist which are auto, break, case, care, const, continue, default, do, double, else, enum, extern, float, for, go to, if and so on like this. Now let us look at uh, this set. Let us try to see what are the keywords which are existing in uh, C plus which are ex which are not in C language. So let us try to see keywords that are not in C language. Okay. So first keyword is try. So can you see try keyword here? You can clearly see that try keyword is not there. So this keyword try is not present in C language. Now this keyword not is also not present in C language. If you can find any keyword here, then that is present in C language. Okay. As well as the keyword union, it is present in C language because union is present in here. But this try and not these two keywords are not present in the C language. Next. In the case of Q, and keyword, you can see and keyword is not present in the C language. Bit and, bit and keyword is also not present in the C language. A complex keyword is uh, you can see it is not present in the C language so uh, in P set P and set Q uh, they are not containing any keyword which is present in C language the only keyword that they are containing is union it is the only keyword which is present in C language now in case of X this auto keyword is actually uh, as you can see this auto keyword is present go to keyword uh, this go to keyword here it is also present as well as if keyword this if keyword is also present in the C language. So this entire set is present in the C language. Okay. In the set Z, int, void and not. Int is present in C language. Void is present in C language but not is not present. So you can see void is here. Okay. And int is here. These keywords are present. So this set X is containing all the keywords which are present in the C language. Okay. Now let us look at for the C++. Obviously, any keyword uh, which is present in C++, I mean C++ contains all the C keywords, which, is, which are the 32 keywords, plus some extra keywords. Now, you can see try keyword is present in C++, try is present in C++, and this not, not keyword you can clearly see here, this not keyword is not present in C++, and union is present. Why? Because union we have seen in the previous slide here, that union is present, but not is not at all present. In the next case, we have AND keyword and uh, this AND keyword is not present in the C++ and BIT AND is also not present in C++ and this COMPLEX keyword it is also not present. All these three keywords are present in C++. INT is present, VOID is present and NOT is not present. So this X is the only set which is having, this is the only set which is having the keywords which are present in C language as well as which are present in C++ but these th other sets are not uh, having any keyword which is present I mean they may be having some keywords which are not present in any of these languages so the first option is saying element in PR C++ keyword which is wrong because here uh, we do not have the keyword not 
element in qr c plus plus keyword which is wrong why because here and bit and and complex none of these keywords is present in c plus plus element in xrc keyword only but those in z are not that is correct because in case of z this keyword is not present and element in x and also in zrc keyword this is wrong because here we have not keyword which is not present in c language so the answer to this question is option number c so i think you don't even need to remember this table you don't even need to remember this table because by practice after some time you'll find out that you can easily get the information um, you can easily remember what are the keywords which are present and what are the keywords which are not present okay the next question is from dbms it is saying for a dbms to be used it must minimally support which of the following operation and which of the following is correct now see in case of dbms uh, dbms is generated using algebra which is also called as relational algebra relational algebra now this relational algebra is having two kinds of operations number 1 those are fundamental operations fundamental operation and second one those are derived operations which are also called as non fundamental operation non fundamental why we call it them as not fundamental because these operations can be derived from the fundamental operations only so fundamental operations are the operations which are absolutely necessary to be in the relational algebra so the fundamental operation is select which is also represented like this the next fundamental operation is project which is represented like this next is cartesian product cartesian product which is represented by x next is union which is represented by u ne next is set difference which is represented by minus sign and the last one is the rename keyword rename which is presented like this in the derived form we have the natural join it can be derived from the fundamental operations natural join can be derived from the fundamental operations the next one is the intersection this intersection can be derived from the fundamental operations the third one is assignment operator this assignment can be derived from the fundamental operations and the fourth one here is the division or quotient operation division or quotient operation and this division quotient operation is a fundamental non not fundamental operation and the fifth one is the theta join and this theta join is also not fundamental operation because it is just a generalized form generalized form of natural join of natural join now they are asking here in this question which of the following must be minimally minimalistically supported or minimally it should be there so these are the keywords which are minimally should be there so select keyword should be there so as you can see here the first case select keyword is there union keyword is there but intersection is not minimalistic because intersection can be derived from the fundamental operations only next select should be there union can be there and this join can be derived from the fundamental operation next select should be there project should be there and join it can be derived next select should be there project should be there and union should be there so answer is option number here point 4 is correct because this is the minimal set here and this is option number a option number a is correct for this and i feel the option which is given in the official answers because in the official answers i have seen that they have given option number c and this option number c is actually wrong in official answers so option answers you can uh, get it corrected over there uh, but i feel the correct answer is option number a for this given question now the next case they are saying uh, they are giving four languages which is language l1 l2 l3 and l4 out of these languages we have machines for the language l1 we have machine m1 for this language we have machine m1 for the second language we have machine m2 for third language we have machine m3 and the fourth language we have machine m4 they are saying the machines recognize the language l1 l2 l3 and l4 respectively which one is correct number 1 m1 and m2 are push down automatas but m3 and m4 are not now here for this we can make a push down automata that is correct for this uh, we can make a push down automata that is correct okay so l1 and l2 are having push down automatas now they are saying m3 and m4 are not now in case of l3 we cannot create a pd push down automata so this is correct but l4 for this l4 we can make a push down automata right so for l4 language for this we can make a push down automata so for l1 l2 and l4 push down automata exist and for the language l3 
this Turing machine exists for language L3. We do not have push down automata. We cannot create a push down automata for the language L3. Option number B is saying M2 and M3 are push down automata, but we we can clearly see that M3 cannot be we can cannot make a push down automata for M3. So option number A and B are wrong. Option number C is saying all M1, M2, M3, M4 are PDS, which is also wrong because for language L2 we cannot create. Uh, sorry, language L3 we cannot create. Okay, we cannot create M3 for push down automata. But option number D is correct, which is saying for language L1, L2, and L4 push down automata does exist. Next case, consider x as an n bit number, which is the power of two, uh, which power k of two. Then sum of x and x minus one contains j zeros where. Okay, so what does they really mean? When they are saying the power k of two, that means that means whatever number this x is showing. For example, this x is a n bit number like this. It is a n bit number from here to here. Correct. And it is a power of two. That means it should be somewhere two raised to power k. Now you can clearly see if you represent two raised to power zero, how you can represent this? Two raised to power one can be represented how much? I mean, how you can represent all these powers of two? Because if you represent all these powers of two, then you can easily solve these questions. If we have total, uh, assume eight bits. Now two raised to power zero can be represented like this: total of eight zeros. Uh, sorry, total of seven zeros and one here. 2 to the power 1 can be represented like this. We have total of these many zeros. Uh, this is 4 0 and uh, yeah, something like this. So this is 4 0, right? So these are total of 8 bits. 2 to the power 2 can be represented like this: 0 0 0 0 0 1 0 0. 2 to the power 3 can be represented like this: 2 0 0 0 0 1 0 0 0. 2 to the power 4 can be represented like this: 0 0 0 1 0 0 0 0. Okay. So whatever the power is. For example, if we have the power 4, that means we have 4 zeros. If we have the power 3, that means we have 3 zeros here. If we have the power 2, that means we have 2 zeros here. If we have the power 1, that we have, that means we have 1 zero in the right hand side here. Okay. Now, if I find it out, 2 raised to power k minus 1. Okay, so this is representing 2 raised to power k and for 2 raised to power k minus 1. If I do 2 raised to power 0 minus 1, 2 raised to power 1 minus 1. 2 raised to power 2 minus 1, 2 raised to power 3 minus 1, and 2 raised to power 4 minus 1. Okay. Why? Because you can clearly see here when uh, they are giving this question. Now, for this particular question, x is representing a uh, power k of 2 that they are writing. Okay. Because consider x is an n bit number, which is power k of 2. And x minus 1 is actually uh, minus 1 from this. So, if this 2 raised to power k is x, so this will be x minus 1. So uh, 2 raised to power 0 minus 1 is all 8 zeros. Okay, 2 to the power 1 minus 1 is uh, we have total of uh, these many zeros, 4 and uh, like this. Correct? 2 to the power 2 minus 1 means we have a 1, 2, 3, 4, and we have 0, 0, 1, 1, which is representing number 3. This is representing number 1, and this is representing number 0. 2 to the power uh, 3 minus 1 is 7, which is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. 2 to the power 4 minus 1 is 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. Okay, so this is we have a correlation that in case in this particular case, whatever number of zeros we have, here we have exactly the same number of ones on the right hand side. Otherwise, all the other digits are zeros. Okay, now they are saying. Uh, if we have the sum of x and x minus 1, right? For example, x can be represented by any one of these. So, assuming that x is like this 0, 0, 0, 0, there are some zeros and they have 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay. So, when they are saying that it is 2 raised to power k, that means here we have uh, k zeros and all the other bits are here. So, if total number of bits here, total number of bits are n, then in x we will be having. Uh, 2 raised to power uh, so x will be having n uh, total n bits so where k bits are 0 the k plus 1th bit is 1 otherwise all the other bits are zeros on the right hand side here okay now in x minus 1 we have all the zeros here all the zeros here only these k bits are 1 only these k bits are 1 okay so in total if you add both this x and x minus 1 so it will be uh, 1 1 1 1 
one 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 up to so on and then we have zeros now you answer me how many ones will be there so these are total of uh, k ones okay these are total of k ones and then we have one more extra one so which is representing k plus ones are there and rest all the bits are zero so in total if we have n bits out of these n bits these many bits are ones then how many zeros are there there are n minus of k plus one which is representing n minus k minus one okay so answer is n minus k minus one which is the option number a and that is the correct answer for this given question i hope that you understood this one and this i feel that you really enjoyed this question i also enjoyed solving this one now let us look at the question number five they are saying consider the following tree we have a tree here and they are saying which one is correct i mean which of the following tree is actually representing a heap heap means uh, root either root will be containing we have two types of heap actually that i should tell you first of all heap either we can have a max heap or we can have a min heap okay so max heap means root always contain the maximum data so in every subtree root always contain the maximum data now here let us check the tree number one so in the first tree out of all the data this is the maximum data that is correct now here also it is containing root is containing the maximum data that is correct so t1 is representing a max heap so t1 is representing a heap max heap in case of t2 in the entire tree this is the maximum data that is correct in this entire tree this is the maximum data uh, that is correct but the problem is this is not a almost complete binary tree okay so heaps are generally almost complete binary trees only now because this is not representing almost complete binary tree that is why it is not a heap even though every root node is contain, containing the maximum data but just because root is not containing this is this tree is not a almost complete binary tree so that that is why it is not a heap so it is not representing a heap now in case of uh, t3 first of all it is present it is a almost complete binary tree that is correct now this is following the heap property this subtree is also following the heap property but this subtree is also following the heap property so uh, all the subtrees are following the heap property therefore this is a heap so t3 is also representing a heap so the only tree that is not a heap is t2 now option number a is wrong because it is saying all the trees are heap that is wrong option number b is also wrong because t2 is not a heap option number c is wrong because t3 is representing a heap option number d is correct because uh, t1 and t3 both of them are representing the heaps okay so option number 3 is correct here i hope that you understood this one let us look, look at next one in mixed mode arithmetic operation an integer is converted to floating point form in the following phases of a typical compiler generally what are the phases of the compiler first of all we have the phase which is lexical analysis we have lexical analysis we give a high level language program to lexical analysis which gives a stream of tokens now from this lexical analysis we give it to syntax analyzer now from this syntax analyzer we get a pass tree which we give to semantic analyzer semantic analyzer from this semantic analyzer we give intermediate code generation intermediate code generation now we give the intermediate code generation to code optimizer and uh, from this code optimizer we generate the target code generation which gives us the assembly language program okay now they are saying uh, an integer is converted to floating point form so no integer cannot be converted to floating point form in the lexical analysis because here lexical analyzer is not give, doing any kind of conversions so lexical analyzer is just to give us a stream of tokens remove uh, extra white spaces remove comments but it is not converting an integer to a floating point form so this one option number a is actually wrong option number b parsing is also wrong because parsing is just checking whether the program is correct or not i mean it will create a parse tree it will create a parse tree but it is not converting it but option number c is a semantic analysis in case of semantic analysis phase only in this phase only we convert integer uh, is converted to a floating point number only in this phase we, we uh, perform some action otherwise in the first two phases we do not perform any kind of action like this they are just checking whether the program is correct or not so option number c is matching and option number d is wrong because intermediate code generation actually gives us a three address code it gives us a three address code um, but it does not uh, change it so correct answer is option number c here next seventh one see one more way i can uh, tell you this one for uh, this uh, c option why it is also correct because here in c option we also create something called uh, give gives something called as actions i mean by looking at certain symbols Uh, by looking at the grammar what actions do we perform okay you tell me the name in the comment what kind of actions do we perform what is called as uh, that particular actions so just comment that 
in the comment section now the question number 7 they are saying the front end of the typical compiler is constituted of which of the following see what are the phases of a compiler one is lexical analyzer the second phase is syntax analyzer the third phase is semantic analyzer the fourth phase is intermediate code generation the fifth phase is code optimizer seventh phase is target code generation and in eighth we get assembly language program now option number 7 here the first option that they are saying is that lexical analyzer syntax and semantic analyzer phases now lexical syntax and semantic they are correct these are the first three phases next they are saying lexical semantic at code generation here this is wrong because uh, before semantic we have syntax analyzer and before code generation we have intermediate code gen uh, uh, so it's this for this is correct but uh, before semantic analyzer we have syntax analyzer so they missed one step here so this is wrong option number c is rightly wrong because intermediate code generation is not in the first phase intermediate code generation it comes here which is very later now option d is saying syntax semantic at code optimizer this is also wrong because they missed lexical analyzer and uh, they missed intermediate code generation also so correct answer is option number a question number 8 is saying the limitation of banker's algorithm resources distribution are as follows option number a it can handle more than two processes option number b number of resources are static option number c number of processes are static and option d both b and c so let us read out something about banker's algorithm by where do we use banker's algorithm actually we use banker's algorithm in operating system in operating system for resource allocation to see whether uh, we are in the safe state or not okay now i have written some text here uh, for all of you they are saying the banker's algorithm has limitations when implemented specifically it needs to know how much of each process a could possibly request but what is the maximum number of resources can a process request number 2 in most system this information is unavailable making it impossible to implement the banker's algorithm because they do not know the first the biggest limitation is you should know what is the maximum number of resources maximum number of resources a process can request a process can request okay and making it impossible to implement the banker's algorithm also it is unrealistic to assume that number of processes is static so number of processes they are saying is static it is unrealistic okay since it most system the number of processes varies dynamically moreover the requirements of that process will eventually release all its resources when the process terminates is sufficient for the correctness of the algorithm however it is not sufficient for practical system waiting for hours even days for resources to be released is usually not acceptable so number of processes are static this is uh, a limitation of banker's algorithm number of resources are static this is also limitation it can handle more than two processes that is correct but these two are the limitations so both b and c is uh, the correct answer that is option number d is the correct answer for option question number 8 the question number 9 is saying parallelism is related to which of the following see we implement parallelism in pipelining so that we can uh, uh, complete more work in less time so uh, you can also always take a example of henry ford and you can always take example of parallelism in computer architecture organization because it improves the performance of the entire system next for multi processor system and vector system parallelism is involved how i have written a small text here multi processor system is the use of two or more central processing units with a single computer system right so we have more than one cpus and when we give parallelism we can give uh, for any program uh, we can give multiple instructions and we can give the instructions which are not dependent on each other to these two processors and they can execute and we can get the work done parallelly and in much faster pace so this multi processor system actually use parallelism as well as this vector computer also uses parallelism pa uh, pa parallelism you can read here i'm not explaining it because it is very easy and very intuitive so correct answer for this question number 9 is option number d here there is a correct answer because all these three concepts uses the mechanism of parallelism question number 10 is saying which of the following is not related to world wide web option number a is related because it is hypertext markup language web pages are written with hypertext mark markup language option number b is also correct because url uh, is the web address of the website option number c is wrong because uml is not used in www it is something else it is a different concept and option number d is correct because http is hypertext transfer protocol that is also used in world wide web so correct answer here is option number c because it is not related to world wide web i hope that you understood this first 10 questions 
So here we have a question from digital in which they are asking in JK flip-flop toggle means. Okay. We have to show what toggle means in JK flip-flop. Okay. So let's look at the characteristic table of our JK flip-flop and then I will tell you what it means. Okay. We have four combinations. J, K, N or Q, N plus 1 means the next output. Okay. So it can be 0, 0. We will check for all the combination 0, 1, 1, 0 or 1, 1. If you remember in SR flip-flop, this state was invalid. But in JK flip-flop, it is not invalid. Okay. So for 0, 0, it will be same as previous output. And it is also known as latch mode. Okay. For 0, 1, it is same as SR. It is 0 and also known as reset mode for one zero it is one and also known as set mode and then for one one okay it is different from SR flip-flop so for one one it is complement of our previous output and this state is known as toggle state so what basically toggle means changing the previous output so option D verifies it changing the output to the opposite state so option D is right for this so the question is in C arguments are passed by passed to functions by value or reference or value result or both A and B from options if we will see we will say both value and reference because we know in C we have a choice between call by value and call by reference but if they are asking in arguments are passed to functions by then we will choose the default value if we are not explicitly mentioning anything then C uses call by value technique not reference technique reference technique yeah definitely we can uh, use reference by using pointers or giving addresses we can definitely use it we can use it but uh, the technique which we use by default is call by value and uh, not option C Call value result it is the combination of call by value and call by result so yeah it is not the right option not reference so both a and b yeah one at a moment can mark this as answer because we know of uh, existence of both the techniques but we will talk about the default value so, so that's why our option a is right for this so question given is the following statements are given BCNF is also in 3NF. 3NF is not necessarily in BCNF. BCNF is stronger than 3NF. 3NF must be in BCNF and we have to find out the false one. Now, this is the question from databases in norm from normalization and we know why we use normalization techniques to remove the redundancy in our data. So, let's discuss about one normal form, two normal form, three normal form and BCNF. We only need up to BCNF here. So, yeah, in one NF, we make sure that our attributes must be atomic. There should not be any multi-valued or composite attributes. And when they are atomic, then only they can be in one normal form. Then we have two normal forms which says which says that there should not be any partial dependency now in 3nf it says a non key attribute should not be giving non key attribute it means no non key non key attributes also there are actually two statements for uh, 3nf if there is a dependency given as a tends to y then if a super key or y is any prime attribute then also it is in three normal form now then comes the bcnf a slight modification in three normal form which says that if there is dependency given as a tends to y then a should be super key and that's all it doesn't talk about the prime attribute on this side so we can say that BCNF is more stricter than 3NF right so 3NF all right so if you say BCNF it is stricter than 
or 3 nf all right all right so BS bcnf is also in 3 nf yes correct or bcnf is satisfying all these properties even it is stricter than all of these 3 nf is not necessarily in bcnf yes right we have first one in normal form then two normal form second normal form then three no, uh, third normal form and then we have bcnf so power goes like this bcnf is most strict okay many times it has not been you know implemented because of this only but yeah it is strict 3nf is not necessarily in bcnf yes true it is true okay bcnf is stronger than 3nf yes true 3nf must be in bcnf not necessary no these two statements are contradictory and it is not necessary that three normal form must be in bcnf so option d is wrong so we have to pick out the false one so option d is right so here we have question from b plus trees and we have few options we have to pick out the incorrect one again so data pointers can be stored at any level of the tree data pointers can be stored only at the leaf nodes of a tree the searching time is same for any key and the leaf nodes contain the search field and the data pointer and we have to pick the incorrect one yeah there is a slightly difference between b trees and b plus trees and sometimes it does create confusion in b trees uh, we are, we distribute the entire index record all over the tree that is at every node we have key and data pointers okay but in b plus tree the structure is slightly different at the root or internal node we have our node pointer then key our node pointer and then key our node pointer and then our key and it goes like this and it is same for all the internal nodes and only at the leaf nodes we have what key and then along with that we have data pointer okay so it depends on the structure also key and data pointer key and data pointer if you will see it is also different in terms of defining the leaf nodes here we do not have node pointers at the leaves only at the only at the root or internal nodes we have our node pointers these are node pointers and this is key pointer and these are our record pointer or we we say here data pointers okay so in leaf nodes only we have our data pointers and these key point, uh, node pointers and key we store in internal nodes in leaf and in root also okay so let's uh, check out the options data pointers can be stored at any level of the tree no we just have seen that data pointers can only be stored at the leaves so option a is wrong data pointers can be stored only at the leaf nodes of the tree yes true we have seen just now the searching time is same for any key yes this statement is true the searching time is same because we have reduced actually in b and b plus tree the difference is the depth is been reduced in b plus trees because we are maintaining our data records only at the leaf and again in b plus trees the the breadth is increased while the height is decreased okay so it makes our searching easy and therefore the searching time for any key is also same because we are maintaining index for all the records this one is also min, uh, pointing to this one and this one so it is same for all the keys for keys only the leaf nodes contain the search field and data pointer yes it contains key and data pointer okay not the node pointer node pointers are only at the internal nodes or or your root node so option d is also right so which option is right we have to pick out the incorrect one so option a is incorrect so we have a question as ssl is designed to provide security and compression services to data generated from application layer security and compression services to the data generated from the network layer or 
security and compression to data generated from physical layer or the security and compression to data generated from the transport layer. Now first what is SSL? SSL is secure socket layer protocol. It is a computer networking protocol for securing connections between network application client and servers over an insecure network like internet. Okay, internet is considered as insecure medium. Okay, or we can also say is that uh, it is for establishing encrypted links between a web server and a browser in an online communication. Okay, so basically SSL is a protocol, security protocol which is maintained by the TCP. Okay, in TCP when we study about the network security in TCP then we study about the SSL and so these B and C options are clearly wrong here not from the network layer or the physical layer now there is confusion between the application layer and the transport layer now we have to read the options very carefully okay security and compression services to the data generated from application layer or security and compression to data generated from the transport layer okay let me just give you architecture of uh, SSL then you will clearly understand what I want to say architecture of SSL it goes like this we have our application layer and then we have our SSL layer okay this is application layer then our SSL secure socket layer then our TCP then IP or then your rest of the layers you can say here we maintain HTTP FTP or our FTP or our um, sorry SMTP right then our SSL our secure net security protocol then transport layer and then our IP so SSL is there in between uh, application layer and the TCP layer okay we can see that so read the options carefully SSL is designed to provide security and compression services to data generated from application layer so this option is right not from the transport layer our data goes like this now from application layer to then TCP and then IP and then again from IP TCP to AL of the destination but our data from the application layer then goes to TCP so our data so option A is right not option D okay SSL is a standard security protocol for establishing encrypted links between web server and a browser okay so they work in application layer okay so we are actually securing our data from app, data coming from the application layer not from the transport layer so option A is clearly right here so our question is data mining is related to knowledge discovery classification clustering or all of the above so let's see first let's understand what's data mining is Data mining is defined as extracting the information from huge set of data or we, we can say that data mining is mining the knowledge from data, huge set of data basically. So let's see if these options justify this or not. Now knowledge di discovery, it is just a synonym for data mining, discovering the knowledge from the data we already have. Now next is classification. We know that classification is a technique in data mining which is used to classify our data. Now for example like in a bank, a bank officer would like to know the potential customers he can give loan. I mean the customers in which there is less chances of risk. So uh, what he will do, he will classify the customers on the basis of their risk, their background, how much they are earning and all these things. So it is basically classifying the data. So yeah it is a part of data mining we do use this technique now third is clustering it is a very well known technique in data mining it is a 
it is grouping of a particular set of objects based on their characteristics and aggregating them according to their similarities it is a very well known technique and we know this and so all these three options are related to data mining so answer would be d So here we have question as how many Hamiltonian circuits are there in a complete graph with n vertices? It is a complete graph with n vertices. Okay. So what is a Hamiltonian circuit? A Hamiltonian circuit is one in which we have to traverse the graph and in that we can visit each node or each vertex exactly once and have to reach back at that at the same node from where we have begun it. Okay. So we have to see how many Hamiltonian circuit exist for complete graphs for one, two, three, and so on. So there are two strategies to solve these kind of question. The first strategy is you. Uh, this is a standard example. So you see the derivation, how it is being solved, and how the answer is being derived. Okay. And second way is you take examples like for for three vertices, four vertices, and see which option is right. We will solve by both the ways. So let's see. First, let's see how it has been derived. So, uh, let's understand it. Here, we are talking about the complete graph. So, every pair of vertices is connected by the edges. Okay. And we can pick in any order of the vertices we want to visit them. Okay. But we have to be careful about the cycles. They are n factorial ordering for of the vertices. Ordering of ordering of vertices and factorial ordering of vertices we can begin from anywhere but like for example it is k3 k3 right complete graph with three vertices so if i begin from one one and then two and then three and have to reach again then one two three the same graph we will get if i will begin with two then i can go to one and then like this now from 2 to 1 and then 3 and then from 3 to again 1 so same graph will be given if I begin from 3 and then 1 and then 2 so it is same these two are same so we have to deduct these also because uh, there are there could be cycles so we do not want the redundancy we want the unique ones okay so we have to reduce them also so there are and factorial ordering of the vertices and then we have to divide it by 2n since each cycle can be written as permutation in two ways 2n ways depending on which of the n vertices you started okay you can start irrespectively but have to check the cycles and which of the two directions you traverse your cycle in like from here you have two direction from which direction you want to go okay so that's why this and this can be written as n minus 1 factorial by 2. So this is uh, one of the way you can solve your question. This is a standard question. So you can remember it. Okay. And the derivation is also easy. n factorial ways to for the ordering of vertices. And then you know, there is redundancies because we have we, uh, we can also have cycles. So we have to reduce for we have to divide it by 2n permutations. There are 2n permutations for that. And so our answer would be d but uh, there is an easy way to solve these kind of questions like if um, this idea do not strike during the exam in your mind so there is a one another way a cheat way we can take the examples like for let's say for example k3 a graph with a complete graph with three vertices okay a b and c okay there is only one hamiltonian circuit for this no no matter from where you start from a or b or c you will get the same so it for this the answer is one okay for k3 answer is one so formula we have uh, derived is n minus one factorial by two so here put the value of n equals to three so we will get what two factorial by two which is equals to one so yeah it is justifying now let's check for example k4 a graph with four vertices a complete graph basically so it is not complete yet now it is a complete graph let's see how many Hamiltonian circuits we can make so one way is this okay this is first way second I can begin from here 
then I can go here here third vertex fourth vertex and then go back to the starting vertex third way I can make, make is begin from here again or and then this one and then this one and then going back to the starting vertex there's no other possible way I can design you can try so for k4 it is n minus 1 factorial by 2 n value has 4 so it will be 3 factorial by 2 so it is 3 cross 2 by 2 so it is 3 so yes our answer is 3 so option option D is right here again So this is a theoretical question and let's read about it. Which of the following is, is the process by which user privileges are ascertained? Now we have given four options and there is confusion between these three authorization, authentication and access control. So there is minor difference between all these three and we have to see which one is the process by which user privileges are ascertained okay so in this I am going to give points and difference between these so listen carefully authorization is the process by which user privileges are ascertained so authorization is the right option it is right okay now what is authentication it is the process by which a user's identity is checked okay now in access control it is the process by which the user's access to physical data in application is limited based on his privileges so it deals with the privileges given to the user authentication it, uh, in authentication we give the ID and password and all these things and we check on the basis of that and authorization in this the privileges are ascertained so option A is clearly right So our question is linked list are not suitable data structures for which of the following problems insertion sort polynomial multiplication radix sort or binary search okay so we know how linked list are maintained we have a node and for the first node we have a head pointer then we have data over here and then here we have node pointer which pointed to the next node and it goes like this all right So, uh, uh, the linked list uh, have only sequential access. Sequential access means if I want to access this particular node, I have to begin from the first node, then here, and then here. I cannot directly access it. Access it. Access it. So it is sequential access. Okay. If we'll see all the op problems, let's look at the binary search problem. What is binary search problem? In this, when elements are stored. Okay and we have the value which I want to search then first I choose a median randomly and then I compare the value of this search key with this and if it is smaller then I go to this side and then if it is bigger than this side so we do this iteratively if it is smaller then we, I will see that my range is here and then again I will choose the median value and then again uh, smaller or bigger and then again the median value so it is iterative process if we look clear um, we can clearly see that in binary search we are randomly access the me accessing the median element okay and which is not possible in a linked list so binary search is not suitable for the linked list if we look at the other options we can easily implement them using linked list okay you can try implementing them so for this binary search is the right option so here we have question from networking which says which of the protocol uses both TCP and UDP so let's check out the options and see which protocol they use so first option is FTP a file transfer protocol it uses TCP and never UDP okay you can uh, you can get confused between uh, your TFTP and FTP it is trivial file transfer protocol and it uses UDP only and T FTP uses TCP only and never UDP next we have SMTP SMTP also uses TP TCP okay now next we have telnet telnet also uses tcp and at port number 23 
now dns so it's not the option it's not the option because they all these three uses tcp dns is the obviously the right option and dns uses both tcp and udp now it uses udp when the when the information is small okay and it uses tcp when the information size is more than 512 bytes okay so dns is the right option which uses both tcp and udp so here we have a question from networking they are asking when you issue ping command what protocol are you using dns dhcp icmp or arp okay so let's check out the options and then i'll tell you which one is correct answer okay so first one is dns dns is domain name server no this is not the answer because we know how dns is used and how it works it is used to resolve the names like when you use your phone book okay you know the name but you don't know the person's phone number okay so you use your phone book same way when we type a particular website in our computer we type the name the name which is very uh, user friendly to us but not for the machine so what dns do is convert that human readable format into the something machine can read like 12123.30 and something like that okay so this is not the option obviously second option is dhcp dhcp is dynamic host control protocol it is used to dynamically assign ip from pool of ips so this is also not the right option now third one is icmp internet control message protocol okay now ping ping is a command ping is a command prompt command okay it is used to check the ability of the source pc to reach the destination okay what it does is it uses the icmp to create the echo request and we wait for the response so yes icmp is the right option okay what icmp does is icmp along with ping it generates a echo request to the re receiver and if re our receiver is reachable and it is, uh, it do not fall under any congestion then it responses then we get a reply okay it is echo request and what we get in uh, reply we get echo okay so and that is how we can know that our uh, destination is reachable okay now the two important thing for using this is uh, for using ping command is how many responses we get and how long it takes to get the response it tells about lot of things like if uh, our destination is free and about the congestion of the path and lot of other things so icmp yes this is the right option the fourth one is arp it is address resolution protocol it is used to get the mac address if we know the ip address so this is not right so our option c is right for this okay so here we have question as shadow pigeon techniques maintain two page tables three page tables four page tables or five page tables now sh uh, shadow pigeon is a technique which is used in transaction and we have we know there are four properties in the transaction that we have to maintain atomicity consistency isolation and durability using shadow pigeon technique we basically ensure that these two properties are well maintained that is atomicity and durability and now let's see how it is being maintained and what is shadow pigeon technique basically so in shadow pigeon technique what we do is suppose this is my database my stable database okay and i will have a database pointer which will be pointing to my database okay perfect now let's suppose uh i have some transaction going on so what i will do is i will create a database separately for it which is known as shadow it will be the exact copy of my database so it is known as shadow database and what we do is during the transaction i will be using only my shadow database not the actual database during my transaction so all the updates that i will be doing all will be done in the shadow database now why we do it 
and why, what are the benefits of is now just suppose you are in the middle of transaction and some failure occur in that case what we do is atomicity what it what it means that uh, either it should be fail or success there should not be any middle state i mean either you complete your transaction and it is successful you make all the changes or if it stop in between then completely fail it okay like nothing has happened so in this what we do uh, we maintain a shadow database and if anything happen wrong something wrong happened then we have nothing to lose we will just cancel it and we will we have already our databases but if everything goes right i have done my transaction and uh, there was no problem then what i will do is i will point my this database pointer now to this shadow database because this is the updated one okay and what i will do i will remove the old database i don't need this because i want the updated database okay and we can clearly see that we are maintaining two page tables here no need of 3 4 or 5 okay so here we have a question which says round robin scheduling behaves like fcfs scheduling when option a says when the time slice is less than the average cpu burst or the time slice is less than the smallest cpu burst or the time slice is greater than the cpu average burst average cpu burst or d option the time slice is greater than the largest cpu burst okay what is round robin scheduling in this we assign the time quantum okay and after the finishing of our time quantum it's a particular time we give and after uh, after finishing of the time quantum we switch between the processes i mean for that this duration only we can allow a process to execute and then we reschedule it but we are saying that when it can behave like fcfs so let me just give an example and you will see uh, when is the time when our round robin scheduling can act like fcfs okay so let's take example suppose we have three processes p1 p2 and p3 let's assume their arrival time to be 1 2 or 3 p1 occur first then p2 and then p3 let's suppose their burst time to be um, 7 or 11 or 4 okay now let's assume i assign my time time quantum to be 15 okay so after every 15 i will switch between the processes now the gantt chart will look like first the p1 came it will get 15 seconds 15 seconds but it needs only 7 okay so after finishing up to from 1 to 8 it will go or you can assume from 0 no need from 1 to 8 it will go and then after that it will go out of our uh, running process and will go back to its uh, state whether it because its requirement for the cpu is now done now p2 will come and it will be assigned then for 11 seconds so it will be 19 up to 19 and then it will go out and then p3 will come up to 23 okay so if we will see it is exactly behaving like fcfs isn't it because the time quantum is too big that the processes their burst time is smaller than the time quantum so they are coming on the basis of their arrival time they are completing it and going out and then the next process is coming so when it is behaving like exactly as fcfs when the time quantum is greater than or combine all the cpu bursts means it is greater than the burst time of all the individual processes so option d satisfy it perfectly that the time slice is greater than the largest cpu burst so here we have a question from software engineering in which they are asking verification and validation are components of software documentation to the quality management software quality assurance or the testing okay so let's first understand what is verification 
so verification mainly it is the process of checking whether our built software is meeting the requirement okay so verification basically deals with the software now validation is the process which checks with the whether the customer's need is fulfilled or not okay the promises which we have made to the customer whether they are fulfilled or not so verification validation is you can say is a complete uh, is the complete set which ask whether the built software is fulfilling our, our software need as well as our customers need so let's see uh, it comes under what component okay now software documentation we know it uh, it is the documentation in which we follow the srs the design which we are going to use the algorithm and the kind of technique i am going to use so definitely ver verification validation does not come un comes under it okay next we have total quality management it is one of the important process in which we not only deal with the coding and testing in you know basically with the technical terms but also with like teamwork okay training like if you are introducing a new software in your company you are building a completely new software for the customer so to train your employees according to that uh, and leadership is also a part so in this it is ensuring that not only you must be good with the technical terms but also whether you are positive enough for towards completing your software it also include leadership ethics improvisation design planning brainstorming sessions it all comes under total quality management now next we have software quality assurance it ensures that the developed software meets and complies with the designed quality specification means i have given a design to the customer that i am going to complete my software like this so this is the uh, technique which says that we are going to fulfill the need of our customer and the software so from the wording itself i uh, we are verifying that these two are the components of our software quality assurance okay now let's is testing we know and testing means testing our uh, testing our software or the components of it uh, we can have we have many testing techniques like black box testing white box testing regression and all these testings to check whether the particular software is meeting the requirements we can also do the real time or the simulation so there are a lot of techniques but it is not part of uh, verification validations are not part of testing okay so here we have a beautiful question from set theory and algebra which is saying the number of binary relations on a set with p elements is so it's a binary relation so in a binary relation two elements are chosen from the set okay because it is a binary relation so two elements will be chosen from the set so with the p elements with the p elements how many pairings are possible p power 2 obviously pairings are possible right why because we have p elements and it is a binary relation so p power 2 pairings are possible with that now a relation can be a subset of these p power 2 pairings right relation can be a subset of these pairing so what will be that 2 p power 2 okay so c option so here we have a question which of the following statement is not true a tree with n vertices has n minus 1 edges or any connected graph with n vertices and n minus 1 edges is a tree a tree with n vertices has n edges or a graph is a tree if and only if it is minimally connected we have to find which one is not true okay read the statements very always very carefully so the easiest way to solve these kind of question is taking an example and verifying the points along with it so you can have your tree at any way you want okay i am having it this way because for me it is easy to visualize it this way so here i have how many vertices 1 2 3 4 5 6 six and how many edges i have 
वन टू थ्री फोर फाइव राइट आई कैन इंक्रीज द नंबर लाइक आई कैन हैव दिस सो देन हाउ मेनी वर्टिस विल बी देर देन देर विल बी सेवन वर्टिस एंड सिक्स एजेस ओके सो आई कैन हैव एनी थिंग आई वॉन्ट सो टेक द मिनिमल एग्जाम्पल इट विल बी इजी नाउ लेट्स कम टू आर ऑप्शन एंड सी वेदर इट इज वेरीफाइंग दिस और नॉट ओके अ ट्री विद एन वर्टिस हैज एन माइनस वन एचेस येस इट इज ट्रू वी हैव जस्ट सीन इफ देर आर सिक्स वर्टिस देन वी हैव एन माइनस वन एचेस so option is right now any connected graph with n vertices and n minus 1 edges is a tree right we have just seen so option b is also right now c option says a tree with n vertices has n edges if there are n vertices we have seen for being a tree it should be n minus 1 but they are saying n edges now let's take a different example you can i can also show this way but i'm just trying every possible thing okay so here i have how many vertices 1 2 3 4 5 five vertices and how many edges i have right now 1 2 3 4 it is perfectly a tree but if i'll have n edges i'll just introduce one more edge now what it is it is a cycle now it is 5 so it now what it is it's it is forming a cycle and a tree is a graph which never has cycle in it so this option is clearly wrong so this is our option because we have to pick which one is not true next option a graph is a tree if and only if it is minimally connected obviously this is the right op this is also right in a graph uh, a tree is always minimally connected that's why it is it has many search properties or many things because we don't need to point everything uh with the same node i if i want to reach here i know how to access this one i don't need to maintain a direct pointer to it okay there are defined ways i can use my trees there are many many uh applications and many implementation we do through trees and there should not be any cycle so our option d is also right so option c is the right answer for this question because we have to pick the wrong So here we have a question which says which of the following statements do not satisfy the principle of structured programming options are the use of loop statements the use of go to statements the use of sequential program statements or the use of if then else statements so let's see what is a structured programming in structure structured programming what we basically do is we divide our program into smaller structures and then we solve them and pass control to other structures vice versa we can do that okay so the main theorem in the in the structured programming entitles like sequences selection selection statements iterations and recursions okay so basically we are just uh defining the structures or routines and we perform our tasks they can be sequential or we can make small iterations on it recursions on it and the selection statements on it so uh the, one of the best example which follow the structure programming method is our c language Okay, C uses structured program. C is a structured programming language. C or Pascal and our Algol also follow structured programming. So let's come to the options. Uh, option A says it uses the loop statements. Yes, it does uses the loop statements. The option B. Let's come to it later. So next is the use of sequential program statements. Yes, it is right. if i am follow following a routine i am using it sequentially okay now the use of if then else statement yes we are using selection here so it is following all the theorems now why not go to statement go to is actually an unconditional statement and it can jump out of the scope of particular structure so that's why it does not come under the structured programming so b is the only option which do not satisfy the principle of structured programming so p is the right option for this so here is a basic question it says a base class is inherited by a derived class an inline function or a constructor or none of the above 
so inheritance is a property by which we can inherit the properties of other classes also okay so there are two things a base class or we can also call it as super class and other thing is derived class or a subclass okay now derived class or subclass is one which inherited the properties from other classes okay and base class or super class is the one whose properties are being inherited so basically it goes like this so base class uh, derived class inherit the properties from the base class so a base class is inherited by a derived class is clear uh, clearly option a is right for this inline functions inline functions are used to increase the run time increase the run time what is the difference like we make function why do we make function so that when in future i want to use them i can again use them by use by giving just name of the function and passing arguments in it inline function is better implementation in this what we do is we implement a function okay inside a class and we give it a name so when a compiler sees it it automatically runs it and it becomes faster during the run time constructor it is totally different concept it is used to initialize our objects so option a is right for this so here we have a question which says the operation of a relation x produces y such that y contains only selected attributes of x such an operation is either projection or intersection union or difference okay so this is the question from databases we will see what it is trying to say that we had x okay x is a relation there are there were some attributes after applying some operations on it we get y and y has only selected attributes like suppose it has previously it had a b c and now it has only a b so out of all these options which operation could be the one which can lead to this kind of outputs okay so let's see i'll tell you the shortcut also you know how to find answer for these kind of questions so first let's see the options the first one is saying projection what is projection projection is selecting the attributes like this uh, i can like uh, suppose i have my relational database which contains the values as suppose alice age 5 or bob aged 7 i say and if i apply my projection on age only i want to know about the age i have so i'll get the output as 5 and 7 so it is only giving me 5 and 7 so yeah projection is the right option because i can drop my attribute values over here intersection it gives the intersection value so it is not the right answer union it will add the values not drop the values so clearly it is not an option difference if i say a minus b what is it say it says all the attributes uh, all the values which are present in a but which are not in b so difference is also not the right option okay now the shortcut trick for this is projection is the only operation which is working on the attributes itself okay on on attributes it can select attributes it can drop the attributes it wants it it can okay so that's why projection is the right answer intersection union and different they work on the values these tuples they cannot drop they do not have the right to drop the values of our attributes okay only projection can do that that's why these three options are wrong and projection is right for this so here we have a question from normalization it is saying that 2 nf 2 a second normal form is based on partial dependency transitive dependency full functional dependency dependency or non trivial functional dependency okay so let me just give you an example it will be clear for you then So suppose I have a relational database which has the attribute a b c d, and I've got my candidate key as a b. Okay, two attributes combined give me my candidate key. Now, they are asking 
2NF is based on partial dependency. Now, first, let me tell you what is partial dependency. Partial dependency means if AB combined our our candidate key, then suppose our B gives C. AB is candidate key, so AB can give C or D, right? But here B is breaking the partnership and giving dependency on its own. So this is partial dependency. And when a uh, relation gives partial dependency, it is not in two normal form. And it, uh, 2NF is not based on this. Okay. Now, next option is transitive dependency. It is not a part of this. It, it comes under the third normal form. According to this, it says that if A gives B and B gives C, which tells that A also gives C. And our second normal form is not based on transitive dependencies also. Now, third one is saying full functional dependency. Full functional dependency means this. When our candidate keys, candidate key, only candidate key give our other attributes. Okay. And they do not break the partnership. If A, B combined our candidate key, they, are, they should not break the partnership and they combine should give other attributes then it is full functional dependency and yes our second normal form is based on full functional dependency now fourth option says non-trivial functional dependency it is quite trivial thing they have asked uh, so what is trivial dependency like suppose a gives b is given and b is a subset of a it is obviously automatically implied that B is derived from A because B is a subset of A. Then it is known as trivial depend, uh, depend trivial dip functional dependency. But they are saying every non-trivial functional dependency comes under 2NF. No, it is not right. If according to this, if our C gives D, okay, or our B gives C, then it also comes under second normal form. But we have just seen that in two normal form, we what we say there should be full functional dependency and on what on our candidate keys. And there should not be any breaking of our partnership. So, option C is the right option for this. So, here we have a question which says, which of the following traversal techniques list the nodes of binary search tree in ascending order? We know we have three techniques. Traversal techniques, post-order, in-order and pre-order. Okay. And they are asking which of the techniques traverse the list in ascending order. Okay. The one of the best way to solve this kind of question is by uh, solving an example, calculating its pre-order, in-order and post-order and then seeing which one gives the ascending order. So let me give you an example. It will be clear for you then. So you know the property of BST. If uh, just suppose if this is my root, then on the right of it, it should be greater than 7 and on its left side, all nodes must have lesser value than 7. So, sub, uh, I am saying 5, it is less, lesser than this. And on this side, I am saying, let's suppose I am saying 9. Okay. Now, again on its right, it should be smaller than this one. So, let's say mm, 2. Okay. And on its left side, it should be greater than this one, but should be smaller than this one. So, let's say I am saying 6. Okay. We must always check whether it is following follow, uh, following the BST properties or not. So it should be greater than seven and less than nine. So let's suppose it is eight. And here let's say eleven. Right. So we will traverse our list in all these three orders and we will check. So first let's check what pre-order gives. The pre-order of this graph will be what seven. This is how we traverse, right? From top to down and left to right. So, where, what is my pre-order? It is 7. Then I am visiting 5. Then 2. Then I am visiting 6. Then I have already visited 7. Then new node is 9. Then 8. And then 11. So, this is my pre-order. Let's check my next in order. So, in order means when I visit the node for the second time. So, for the first time, 
no it will make my traversal easy okay so two for the first time second time so two then five then second time six then second time seven you know how to calculate the in order so i'm doing the same way it is easy then eight and then it's nine and then eleven so i can see that it is it is actually in order which is traversing my list in ascending ascending order so in order is the right answer so let's traverse it post order also so it will be what when i visit a node for the last last time so 2 is visited last time so it's 2 then 6 and then 5 is visited last time then 5 7 is visited second time so it's not the time to write it now 8 is visited last time then 8 then 11 is visited last time then 9 is visited last time and then in the end 7 so this is our post order so out of all we have picked our right answer so in order is the one which gives the uh, traversal in so here we have a question which asks telephone network works in single mode transmission half duplex mode transmission full duplex mode transmission or arbitrary mode transmission now we all know when we talk in a cell, uh, telephone then both the parties can communicate simultaneously like suppose if we have a sender here and a receiver two people they can simultaneously exchange the information and that's why it is known as full duplex communication or transmission so the telephone network the answer c is correct what is single mode when only one party can send the data half duplex means both the parties can send but only one at a time like walkie talkie arbitrary mode transmission it is just mixed like randomly if uh, s is sending data r can send data but it is not always possible it is not the case at all so full duplex uh, uh, full duplex perfectly satisfy for telephone network so here the question is in tcp ip protocol suite layers are arranged from bottom to up as follows okay so we have to go from like physical layer then data link layer and all these so they are asking how they are arranged we have two models osi model and tcp ip model they are talking about tcp ip in this sessional layer and presentation layer are not present okay so for tcp it goes like first we have physical layer then we have data link layer then we have network layer then we have what transport layer and then application layer So, which of the options satisfy F, P, D, N, T, and A? So, C option is right for this. So, here we have question from compilers. They are asking, tokens are identified during lexical analysis, syntax analysis, semantic analysis, or the code optimization. It is very easy question. We know what are tokens. Everything defined in C language, whether it is a bracket or words or everything, they are known as tokens and which one is the first phase so obviously if the, they are the very first step they will be re uh, identified as soon as possible so lexical phase in syntax phase we check for the syntaxes using grammars then we have semantic in this we make the parse tree and then check the semantics code optimization is totally different this we use three address registers and all these things okay so tokens just think of it like like i have a print statement printf hello so how many tokens are there number of tokens here are 1 1 2 under these double quotes everything is considered as 1 so it's 3 
this closing brace is 4 and 5. So we have number of tokens as 5. Okay. So yeah, this is the answer. In lexical analysis phase, white spaces and comments are also removed and also identifying token is done at this phase. So here we have a question which asks, in function point analysis, number of complexity adjustment factors are 10, 20, 14 or 12. Now what is function point analysis? The, it measures the functionality from user's point of view. It measures the functionality from user's point of view. Like when you give your product to the user, then from user's point of view, we will check whether he is getting what he asked for. He, the, you, the end user do not care about the line of code, algorithm that you are using and all these things. All he cares about is when he give you your software like what is his demand then he care about whether your software is giving all those functions or not doesn't uh, doesn't care about the line of code and all these things okay so they are asking number of complexity adjustment there are 14 actually number of complexity adjustment factors which checks the overall uh, analysis of our software okay so they are asking for the number of complexity adjustment factors so it will be 14 So here we have a question why cyclomet cyclometric complexity is given by okay and we have a few options here. So first of all why cyclometric complexity is done cyclometric complexity is done to check the complexity of our program okay it is also known as structural complexity also okay and it is done to check whether all the parts of the code are executed at least once okay so uh, cyclometric complexity is calculated for the flow graphs like uh, when we use loop statements or if and else statements uh, there we form a flow graph from it and then on the basis of that we make parts and components and predicate nodes and from that we try to calculate the cyclometric complexity of our program okay so here i'm going to give one example on the basis of that we will check whether these formulas are correct or not okay so let's consider i have an example this or this you know all these are flow graphs we are just giving the flow let me make it more complex so that when they will ask easy question you will be easy it will be easy for you to calculate okay so i think this is good example to give okay now first one is saying vg is equals to e minus n plus 2 here e indicates the number of edges okay and n indicates the number of vertices okay so here if we'll, if i'll see how many edges are there one Two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So E is equals to seven. Okay. And uh, how many V's are there? I mean N. You can also say N or V. So how many N are there? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six. Okay. So we have they are uh, saying the formula for the first one. V G is equals to E minus N plus two. So here we are getting 7 minus 6 is 1 plus 2 equals to 3. Okay, so we are getting 3 cyclometric complexity from the first formula. Let's check for the second one. The second one says it is Vg is equals to, uh, we can say it is pi or p. Okay, pi or p. It is predicate node, we can say. Okay, what is predicate node which has uh, the shortcut is which has two outgoing edges. Two outgoing edges means it has either true or false like like this one true true or false. So it has two statements right. So this one is our predicate node. So how many predicate nodes are there? This one is predicate node first. It has two outgoing edges. This one is predicate node. 
it has two outgoing edges this one is not predicate note because it has only one outgoing edge this one is incoming edge and this one is also not predicate note because it has one incoming edge and one outgoing edge so how many we got predicate notes two so it's two plus one equals to three so we are getting same answer as this one now let's check the next one the third one it says the number of regions number of regions now what are number of regions like this this is a region it is enclosed okay so it is a region so it is first region this is open right everything so this is second region overall okay is there any one any enclosed region yes this one is here so three so three we are getting same answers for all these three it means that all these three formulas are used to uh, to calculate our cyclometric complexity so our answer would be d all of the above all three are used to measure the cyclometric complexity so here we have a basic question which says if the base register holds 300040 and the limit register is 120900 then the program can legally access and they have given few options to us right so let's check it now when we store some information okay i suppose we we have this sort of information stored sequentially and they are saying that uh, suppose my here okay they are saying the base register from where the program actually begins is storing 3 zero 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 four zero and they have also given the limit register limit register tells up to with this part only our program can access the memory particular memory okay not more than that so let's suppose i am giving limit up to here so it is given as one two zero nine zero zero all right so they are saying it can legally access so we will check the up to which memory they it can access okay so base the uh, in this the value for base will never change okay so it will be calculated as it is and for this it is beginning from uh, 40 so we will reduce one value from it we know how why so it will be 1208 Nine nine, up to this limit, right? But uh, and we are beginning from four zero, so it will go up to eight nine nine. So it will be nine. We will add because we want to find the uh, the amount it can legally access. Okay, this particular program, the mem the memory it can legally access. So it will be nine, three, nine zero, two and four. It's four two zero nine nine three nine. So option. matches with this only it can access from here up to here only inclusive right this one is saying all addresses from 300412 this is uh, they what they are doing is they are changing the base but we are not allowed to change the base because they have already given it okay and we calculate from the base only so base will never be changed and up to the limit we will reduce one because we are changing uh, we are starting from the base so this is the right option for this option so this is the question in this they have given us a grammar and then they have asked us to find the first of a okay and first of b and then find the intersection between these two in this question there is slightly um mistake actually in place of c they want to make it as terminal small c okay so just correct it this is small c it is a terminal symbol okay because it is in one of the option and you will see why i'm saying this okay so let's find out the first of these two non terminal symbols we know how to find the first so first of a will be calculated as what it will be c terminal c and a and if you find for b it will be c and b now they have asked for the intersection of first of a and first of b which is c obviously so answer is c so option d matches with it there sometimes happens that they give the uh, some printing errors so don't worry about it they will marks will be granted for all the students 
if not then also we can use a common sense that it is obviously a terminal uh, symbol c and that that is the only way we can get this answer as c hello so here we have a question from automata and they have given us some regular expression over the alphabet 0 comma 1 and it is 0 star 1 0 star 1 0 star 1 0 and they are asking what it denotes all binary strings poss possessing exactly three ones all the non-empty binary strings or all the binary strings including empty string or all the binary strings possessing more than two ones okay so in this kind of question they try to confuse you with the words so when these kind of questions come you have to read each an option very carefully and have to match with the given regular expression okay so first try to analyze this regular expression in this it can have any number of zero and then one any number of zeros or just epsilon and then one any number of zeros then one and zero okay so what the first option says it says all the binary strings possessing exactly three ones yes it is right exactly three ones not less than three not more than three so yeah option a seems right at the moment now all the non-empty binary strings all the non-empty binary strings but have to be exact now according to this even if i write one zero it is non-empty this will also be accepted but if you look at the regular expression this is not accepted so option b is wrong okay now look at the third option all the binary strings including empty strings yeah okay fine then again same example uh, we uh, there has to be three ones they are not uh, you know focusing much on these factors and it is saying all the binary strings including empty strings including empty strings no it is not right because uh, compulsory we need to have one 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 and zero okay this uh, this this and this so it has to be there and they are saying including empty string so because of this the statement is also wrong now it is saying all the binary strings possessing more than two ones this is also not right why because according to that if i do this this then also it will be accepted by our regular expression because they are talking that m only more than two ones i can have any number of ones but no this is not right so option a is right for this so here we have a question from software engineering which is saying mutation testing is related to false seeding functional testing genetic algorithm or fault cracking now let's first talk about what is mutation testing mutation testing is one in which we intentionally add few bugs in our built software okay what we do is we make intentionally few bugs or some error code we intentionally add them in our code and then we check it against the test cases if our software is able to rectify those error then it is fine otherwise not then we again recode it okay and we know one of the uh, one of the most famous uh, mutation testing is false seeding in this we add small small codes of few bugs and check against mutation testing so option a is the right answer for this so here we have a question program volume of a software product is and we have given few options and this is used to find the complexity of our software there's so many there is a metric and so many parameters through which we find the complexity of our software like vocabulary testing time size difficulty errors and efforts and all this thing and volume is a volume is one part of it and for the program volume we know how to calculate it it is calculated as v is equals to size into log base 2 vocabulary all right in which in which size is calculated as n1 plus n2 now where n1 represent the occurrence of operators okay and n2 represent the occurrence of operands operands occurrence of operands and n1 is occurrence of operators all right then we have vocabulary 
it is calculated as n1 plus n2 where n1 represents the number of unique operators unique not duplicate number of unique operators and n2 as number of unique operands operands okay so in one of the option they are asking how this is calculated we have derived the formula this can also be represented as v is equals to size is also defined as this one is written as what capital n all right and this one is can be written as small n small n so if you put in this formula it will be size into log base 2 small n which matches with our first option so this is the right answer so here we have a question from encryption the question says the general caesar cipher substitution function for encryption is given by the four options are given and where p is plain text letter and k takes on a value in range from 1 to 25 so we know caesar cipher encryption method is, uh, was the previous one okay before this one caesar cipher substitution uh, function was also known as shift cipher uh, like suppose uh, for letter c example i'm giving for letter c alphabet c i'm saying if it is third let's suppose i'm adding three to it then after a b c it is on third place i am adding three to it so d e f so c will be represented as f so this is shift side for substitution but uh, this is one of the weakest form of encryption because one can guess it or by checking the frequency and all these things so it was quite weak so what he does is he introduced a function to it and through that he saw that the results are better now so what he does is he calculated as the text the cipher text the final output that we will be get by by making the our plain text letter whatever we are using by adding it to some random number that we will choose and here they are saying it will be range from 1 to 25 okay and then mod 26 so this is a stronger method than the previous one and they are asking for the caesar cipher substitution function for encryption it is given by the first option if you look at the d option this is for the decryption okay if we perform encryption by using this uh, caesar cipher function then we will decrypt it by this method okay and this is for encryption so here we have a beautiful question which says the nearest value of 113 base 16 into 3.6 base 8 is and we have given few options in different bases okay so i'll tell you the trick how can we find very easily and also the standard way to solve these kind of question okay so these two have different bases so we cannot multiply them directly so what is the best way to convert in into base 10 okay so let's convert them so 1 1 3 base 16 into 3.6 base 8 so let's just convert it when I convert it, it's 16 1 the 16 plus 1 17 17 7 into 270 272 plus 3 base 10 so I can also say 275 base 10 into it it will be 3.6 by 8 is 3 by 4 it is 75 so it's 3.75 in base 10 all right so if we will calculate 275 base 10 into 3.75 base 10 you don't actually need to calculate it because in exam you do not you have no right to use the calculator so you can just guess it so this value will approximately will be greater than 1000 uh, I have calculated uh, it and it is approximately it is approximately going more than 1000 so it is approximately 1031.25 okay you can guess it that it will be obviously more than 1000 okay 
so which is op uh, matching with the option b but let's check the other options also right so how we will solve this kind of question is we will just check that what value it is trying to represent and what is the answer we have got if they are near to each other or not we will solve these kind of question by approximation this is the way how we can solve them very fast okay so if we will convert this into decimal it will be 2 plus 60 16 plus 8 plus 2 just forget about this so it will be approximately 26 so no a is not the right option yeah b is very close to this so yeah b could be the right option now look at the c it is in big 16 and this is 118.8 .8, right if you look at this this is 113 in base 16 so this value is even smaller here we are going even multiply by something so it will be bigger so obviously this is clearly wrong why because this one will obviously be get uh, will get bigger value when we will multiply it by other value and this one is only 118 now look at the option number four this is in base 8 so let's f quickly convert it into base uh, base 10 so it will be 32 32 plus 6 32 plus 6 into into 8 plus 7 so it will be 2 to 8 plus 7 so approximately we are getting 235 base base 10 I'm just ignoring decimal they don't make much change okay so approximately we are getting our value in more than 1000 and only B option matches with it so that's why B is the right option in these kind of question what you have to do you uh, you should not you know calculate the values on your own because you do not have calculator so try to find by approximation check what are the uh, other options are trying to you know uh, calculate the values and what is the value we have got by approximation this is the best way to solve these kind of questions okay so here we have a question from unix they are asking us the unix command for this is what it is trying to do okay so they are using the cat command here cat command is very useful command in our unix in our unix and it has many useful functions okay so um one of the function I'm trying to show here is suppose we have a I have a file which is file one okay dot txt and I have file two dot txt what is what it is trying to do it is trying to copy the uh, one file content to other overwrite it basically okay so I am giving this in uh, example so that you can understand what th this is trying to do okay if you look at this it, what it is doing is cat command first will merge these files abc and def and then it will copy to xyz okay it will merge abc and uh, def these two files it, this is file 1 and this is file 2 it will merge these two file and then it will copy to xyz and out of all options C option is right for that okay I can also write this one as how cat okay A B C T E F okay on X Y so this is also one of the way I can do the same work merging these two file and then copying it to the third file so option C is right for this